Well, good morning. Thank you for being here early on the second day of, a conf of the conference. I know that's a hard time slot to show up for. So six years ago, when I built my first Rails app, deploying it was like magic. With one command, I could get that software out of my laptop and into the internet and accessible by people around the world. Now, it was a phenomenal way to get started, and at the time, I wondered if deploying my Rails code would always be that easy. But pushing to Heroku only got me so far. Pretty quickly, I found that the applications I built, and especially the legacy ones I had to maintain, became much more complicated than what I could do with Heroku. Now, in addition to this, although my first few Rails jobs focused on software as a service applications, I eventually moved on to producing software that was packaged and distributed. So rather than running my apps only on my own infrastructure, I had to enable customers to easily be able to install my software and run it on their own infrastructure. This morning, I will share a journey through deploying, packaging, and distributing Rails software. Now, although this is, is based on my personal journey, I suspect many of us here at Windy City Rails are on or will be on a similar journey. So this journey consists of four stages. The first is just deploying Rails software, moving beyond Heroku, then packaging that Rails software into installers that customers can use on their own infrastructure, then distributing that Rails software Remember, software essentially does not exist if people can't find it. And finally, we will look at some new technologies for creating software packages that can run almost anywhere and have the intelligence to self-organize and self-heal. This is the cutting edge, really exciting stuff, and we'll get to that. But before we start down this path, however, Let's briefly cover who I am. I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. I'm a senior software engineer at Chef. I'm also a core maintainer of the Habitat project. I, that is an open source project through Chef, which I'll talk more about a little bit later. I'm the co-host of the Food Fight Show podcast, where we talk about Chef, development, ops, DevOps, and everything in between and beyond those. Although I live in Seattle now, I am a former resident of Southern Illinois. Uh, O'Fallon, Illinois, is anyone here with, uh, familiar with O'Fallon, Illinois? Yay, all right, little town right by uh, St. Louis. Uh, you can tweet at me at at Nell Shamrell or email me at nshamrell at chef.io and I will put these contact details back up at the end of this talk. So let's begin our journey with stage one, deploying Rails software. Now again, like many Rails developers, I started off by deploying my applications to Heroku. And one example is an early edition of the website of Operation Code. Operation Code is an organization dedicated to teaching software engineering to veterans of the US military. If you are a veteran or want to be involved in helping veterans, please catch up with me after this talk or send me a tweet. Now this runs on AWS now, but when we were just getting started, we ran the website as a Rails application on Heroku. And Heroku seems super easy and super magical when you're the one using it, but let's briefly cover how it works beneath that magic. So when you run git push Heroku master from your workstation, that pushes your co the code on your workstation to Heroku origin on GitHub. Heroku then pulls that code from the origin on GitHub and runs it through a build pack. The build pack pulls in all the dependencies for your Rails application, so that includes the Ruby runtime, any gems, and more. The build pack then bundles it together into what Heroku calls a slug. So there's our cute little slug. Now this slug contains your compiled and assembled application code ready to install and run. So Heroku then loads that slug onto what they call a dyno. There's our little dyno, and he loves the slug. A dyno is a lightweight Linux container running on Heroku's infrastructure. This makes it accessible over the internet to you and your users around the world. Now what Heroku is great for is speed, for getting an application up and running fast and with minimal effort. In the early days of Operation Code, it was critical for us to get a website up quickly where we could, veterans could sign up for our program and where we could process donations. So this is fantastic when you're building prototypes or anything you want to rapidly iterate on. Heroku is also great in that it has a very sophisticated system of plugins, which makes it super easy to add services like Redis, SendGrid, and more in just a few clicks. Now as for what Heroku is not great for is when your infrastructure needs are different from their standard stack, when you need something more flexible for your particular application. 
So part of what makes Heroku so fast is that, kind of like Rails, they strongly lead to convention over configuration. So if your infrastructure needs a different stack, Heroku is probably not the best option. Additionally, Heroku gets very expensive as your application grows. The more plugins you use, the more you use those plugins, the more money you will be paying to Heroku to run your app. Now, although I used Heroku frequently when I was learning Rails, my early paid Rails work was at a hosting provider where we ran our own infrastructure. Heroku was not an option for us, so we had to use a different tool called Capistrano. Who here has used Capistrano? Quite a, quite a few hands up. So Capistrano allows us to specify what servers we want to deploy our code to and do that deploy over SSH. It's very powerful and very flexible. Nearly every closed source Rails project I've worked on use Capistrano as its deployment tool. So how Capistrano works is when you're here on your workstation in the repo for your application code, you create a cat file. And among many other things, you set the repository for your code and the specific servers you want that code deployed to. So then when you deploy with Capistrano from your workstation, it SSHs onto whatever server you want to deploy to, and then it pulls that code from your GitHub repo. This is if you're using Git. Capistrano also works very nicely with other source control systems. And then it copies that code to wherever it needs to be on your remote server. Usually this is in a releases directory. And it runs it. So you'll be able to access your app from that server. Now as for what Capistrano is great for is set hardware where your infrastructure seldom changes, and you're comfortable with workstations that deploy to that infrastructure having SSH access to those servers. Capistrano is also super useful for long-lived servers. That's because they enable you to both deploy them and manage previous releases on them and easily be able to roll back if something goes wrong with a new release. Now, as for what Capistrano is not great for, it's short-term, short-lived infrastructure that frequently changes. In particular, dynamic infrastructure, things like auto-scaling groups where your application is meant to uh, scale horizontally, where it spins up new servers when your traffic surges and then contracts and spins them down when traffic drops off. Now Heroku's main advantage is its speed, Capistrano's main advantage is its flexibility, but something these tools have in common is they are usually particularly effective when your software only needs to run in one or two places. Again, things like software as a service apps or web-based applications. But you find their limitations pretty quickly when you are not the only one running your software, especially when it is distributed to hundreds or thousands of customers to run on their own infrastructure. In that case, you likely need to create and distribute an installer package. So that brings us to stage two of our journey, packaging Rails software. Now, when I first started working at Chef, I worked on the supermarket product. Supermarket started out as one public site for the Chef community to share cookbooks, tools, and more. Now, after we launched it in 2015, we had several customers say, I love this supermarket site, but I need a private version of it that I can run on my own infrastructure. This is for companies who, for licensing reasons or security reasons, cannot share their code on the public internet and cannot use code on the public internet until it has gone through rigid security controls. What they can do, however, is share their internal cookbooks and tools with each other, but they wanted to have that supermarket experience internally. So these customers wanted a packaged or boxed version of the software that included all the dependencies and was really easy to get installed and running with very quickly. So when you distribute software, you need to make it as easy to install and run as possible. And that usually involves creating an installer package. I mean, yes, you can have someone download your source code, compile it themselves, install all the dependencies, and then execute it on their own infrastructure, but that's really not a great user experience, especially for commercial software. So one option to package up your Rails applications with all their dependencies is to use a tool called Packager. And how Packager works is when you're on your workstation, you run the Packager package command and pass it the path to the repo with the source code you want to package. So Packager then runs it through a build pack, the very same build packs that Heroku uses, in fact, to bundle up, and, to bundle up that software into that executable package. 
So it embeds the Ruby runtime, gems, any system dependencies you specify into that package, and then it spits out either a deb or RPM package. There's our package, which can be used to install your software in all the dependencies on either Debian or Yum flavored systems. Now what Packager is great for is when you are already used to the Heroku workflow. And like Heroku, it's particularly great for getting new applications or prototypes packaged very quickly. Packager also offers a hosted service, which means on the, they use their own, for, own infrastructure to build your code and give you a place to store your packages. So when you use their hosted service, every time you push new code to your GitHub repo, the hosted service fetches that code, runs it through the build packs on Packager's infrastructure, fetches all the dependencies, then generates that deb or RPM package and puts it in your own after Yum repository on their infrastructure, which you can then uh, send to whoever you want to be able to download it. Now as for what Packager is not great for, to my knowledge, Packager only generates deb and RPM files which does work for the majority of Linux systems, but definitely does not cover all systems your customers might want to use to run your software. As for alternatives, one of them is Omnibus, which is another project from Chef. That is what we use with public supermarket at this point and private supermarket. Omnibus can generate packages from many different environments, including Linux, OS X, and Windows. Very useful, but there is a lot of overhead to its use. Another alternative is Habitat. And we'll talk more about Habitat in just a bit, so stay tuned. Now, once you have your software packaged, you need a way to distribute it to your customers. And that brings us to stage three of our journey, distributing software. Now, there are a few key concerns to this. One is that once your software is packaged, your customers need to easily be able to find it. Now, we used to put software in literal boxes in stores. I think. The, yeah, the last box software I can remember buying, uh, it was the midnight release of World of Warcraft Cataclysm. I showed it to Best Buy at midnight. I uh, got my little box uh, with my CD-ROM in it, got home, put that CD-ROM in my computer and installed it and I was ready to go. But nowadays software is primarily distributed over the internet, but you still need a place to store that software where people can easily find and download it. Additionally, you may need the ability to restrict access, depending on the type of software, especially licensed software that people have to pay for. So one place to store your artifacts is JFrog Artifactory. And I had to add in a little frog there. There he is. JFrog Artifactory is a universal artifact repository manager, and that's a lot of words, but what it means essentially is that it can store software packages created by any language or technology. It is a single place where you can both access external packages and store your own built packages. Now for the sake of time, I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but check out the JFrog Artifactory website if you want to know more. Now the question this brings us to is, am I always going to need to generate a different package for each platform I want to support? Now two years ago, I would have said yes, but a lot changes in two years. And that brings us to the final stage of our journey, which is packaging software in a way that it can run almost anywhere. And to do this, we're going to use Habitat, again, a project I'm a core maintainer of outside of Chef. Habitat is briefly a new technology to build, deploy, and manage applications in any environment, from your traditional data centers to your containerized microservices. With Habitat, we create one package that currently can run on any x86 Linux platform. Now we are working on making it so you can run that one package on any x86 Linux, any ARM Linux, and on Windows. Now that work is still ongoing. We're not quite there yet. So for now, it's any x86 Linux system. And how it works is when you package software with Habitat, it starts here with you, the user, at your workstation. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's a Linux, Mac, or Windows worksta workstation, Habitat works on all of them. And on that workstation, in the same repo as your application code, you create what we call a plan. This contains all the information needed to deploy, start, and run your application. Now on Linux systems, this is written in Bash. On Windows systems, you soon will be able to write it in PowerShell. You then use the Habitat command line tools to build what we call an artifact. 
This contains both the compiled application code and everything needed to deploy and automate it. This is all kept in one place. That artifact is signed with an encryption key to let someone verify where it came from. Finally, that artifact can optionally be uploaded to the public Habitat Depot. The Habitat Depot is where we store software packaged with Habitat, and you can find different packages from developers from all over the world. Now, Habitat does not only package your software, it also helps you run your software. If your package is on that public depot, you can pull that artifact off of the depot and onto wherever you want to run it. And you can use that same artifact for bare metal, for a virtual machine, or in a container. Now, if you're not using the public depot, you can upload that package using SCP, FTP, whatever you want, pretty much, to upload that artifact to wherever you want to run it. So once that artifact is on wherever you want to run it, in this illustration, we have a MySQL Habitat package running on a virtual machine. Habitat runs, in, runs it using what we call the Habitat Supervisor. Now, the supervisor runs services. And what I mean by a service is one Habitat package running under one supervisor. And the simplest example of this is one service running on one piece of infrastructure. Now, the real power of the supervisor becomes apparent when we're running more than one instance of the same package. So in this case, let's say we start off with just one MySQL server, but soon we decide we want to run a MySQL cluster as our application grows. So we spin up two more virtual machines running that same Habitat package, and the supervisors on each of these virtual machines will form a ring. They become aware of each other and communicate, I think, Someone's trying to intercept our communications right now, but we'll keep going. Over an encrypted gossip protocol. This is the protocol that will be used to communicate configuration changes, keep track of which one has which role in that cluster, and more. Now, it's common with a database cluster to run it in what's called a leader-follower topology. So let's say we want to run this cluster in a leader-follower topology. We can tell Habitat to do that when we start the supervisor on each VM, and we'll see that in just a moment. So once that supervisor ring is up and running, it will realize, without any human intervention or any central manager intervention, that it needs a leader. So it will, completely on its own, hold an election using an algorithm we built into Habitat. So let's say this one, let's pretend we're seeing this one here at the top is, wins the election, so it becomes the leader, and it will receive all the right requests that come into this cluster, and then these other two will become followers. So they will handle all read requests that come into that cluster. Now let's say something bad happens and the leader goes offline. Uh, I, I, the data center catches fire, or whatever have you. Uh, true story, ask me about that later. But the other two members of the ring will realize that they cannot communicate with the leader, and they will remove it from that supervisor ring. So now we have two followers and no one to handle the right requests that come into that cluster. So completely on their own, our two followers are going to realize they're no longer in a leader-follower topology. They need a leader, so they will automatically hold another election and they will use that election using the built-in algorithm, and then one of them will win that election and become the leader, so it will automatically start handling all the right requests, and the one on this, over on the other side will become the follower, and it will handle all the read requests. Again, this requires no outside intervention, whether from a human or whether from a central orchestrator or manager. So Habitat works great on both bare metal and virtual machines, and we just saw it working on a virtual machine, or well, you will later when you come to me with my laptop, but where Habitat really shines is when it comes to working with containers. Now nowadays, especially in the DevOps community, containers are the new hotness. I mean, over the past two or three years, I keep hearing Docker, 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 and to a lesser extent, rocket, 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 two different types of containers. Now before I go into Habitat, how Habitat works for containers, I want to make something very clear. So I found a long time ago that techniques with four-year-olds work really well with engineers. So I'd like to share with you my, one of my favorite jokes, which is, what's this? It's a dead one of these. <laughs> what's this? It's a whole flock of these. <laughs> and then finally, one of my favorite ones is, what's this? I don't know, but there goes another.
We'll make it work. I can, I can just talk. We'll make it work. So, so back to containers. Habitat does not compete with current container technologies. It complements them and makes them work better. Whenever I go out in the public and I talk about Habitat, or especially on Twitter, people ask me, why are you trying to compete with Docker or Kubernetes? And the answer is, we're really not. What we're doing is we're making it easier to create those Docker images or rocket images or whatever you prefer and then run them wherever you want to. So we would, uh, you can also see the demo later, we would create, a use, package up our Rails application and create a Docker container image. Now we can then run that container image on Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Mesosphere, whatever you prefer, and it works very, very nicely. So as we wrap up, something I want to make clear, and let me advance the slides just a little bit, and that is that packaging your software is most useful when you are distributing it, when you want someone to be able to run it on their own infrastructure, and not only get your application, but all the dependencies of the application ready to run. But it's not limited to this situation. Having your software packaged in one place with all of its dependencies as an immutable artifact can be useful any time. This is because it forces you to automate your deployments, to automate both your build process and your deployments, which not only sets you up very well if you ever need to distribute that software, but it also uh, forces you to use good habits when deploying and building that software. And with that, I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. Uh, my info is Senior Software Engineer at Chef. There's my contact info, and thank you. It's wonderful to be back here in Chicago. Thank you so much for having me.